Artificial intelligence is changing the way so many industries operate, and healthcare, which is more than 17 percent of the U.S. GDP, could show significant change in patient care as a result. Joining us right now to talk about this, healthcare technology and much more, is the Cleveland Clinic CEO, Dr. Tom Mahalovich. And Tom, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. We, we talk so much about AI, and right now it feels like we're talking about all these things that could come to fruition potentially. We have not focused on healthcare and what it means, but you've been digging into it pretty deeply. What, what is the promise, let's start with, for AI and what that could mean for patient care? Well, we are very enthusiastic about application of AI in patient care in general in every segment of patient care. Uh, you know, today there are so many advances in knowledge, in healthcare information, that we as healthcare providers are coming, so to say, to the limits of our own human ability to synthesize all the information and really provide the best possible care for our patients based on that information. So, you mean the, the, the best possible latest research for whether it be cancer, whether it correct. be heart disease or something down the line. It's too much for the human brain to actually catalog? It, it is too much to catalog. Too much to catalog and therefore artificial intelligence is a crucial technological advancement that will allow us to do that. Well, how are you using it right now? Well, we're using artificial intelligence in clinical applications already to uh, diagnose, for example, a life-threatening illnesses that have a relatively subtle symptoms at presentation. The best uh, example is sepsis, which is a bloodstream infection that is one of the leading causes of death in hospital setting. Yet the beginning of sepsis can be so subtle that clinicians, even when they're very, very attentive, cannot detect it. But if we aggregate the information that is being provided to us from multiple different sources and use artificial intelligence that leads to earlier detection, earlier treatment, and far better outcomes. That, for years, how many biotech companies, the landscape is littered with people that tried to take on sepsis, and maybe maybe that's it, because once it gets started, what the cytokine, it just, it, right, the release, you can't stop it, but if you could get it early, yeah. you, don't need, you don't need like the perfect uh, monoclonal antibody to, to fix it. It's, if it's early enough, you can stop it. The, you're, you're absolutely right. Every minute, every hour counts. So our ability to detect it early is crucial. Seems like at, the ability to detect it early at scale. For cancer, it seems like the same thing. Too, oh, right? cancer is the best example. I mean, the new knowledge in cancer, new therapies in cancer are blossoming. And as a result, what we are looking today, let's say 1970s, the chances of survival of types of cancer was 50-50. Today, it's a 75%. Mm. So we're moving really, we're making so much improvement in cancer care, but to make even a bigger leap, we will need artificial intelligence to help us synthesize all the knowledge. Not just synthesizing the knowledge, I would also think detection on oh. early levels on some of these things too, because cancer, if you catch it early enough, you, you can't, you have much better chance of survival. There's a synthesizing the knowledge. There is a, a huge opportunity for earlier detection. We know all the new molecular tests and new imaging modalities. And uh, there is much more to it. There is a use of artificial intelligence in actually a research, cancer research and not other biomedical research. The problem is the computing power to use these things is so expensive, and most hospitals often operate on a profit margin of 3% or less. Correct. So how do you possibly afford piling money into resources for this right now on a, on a broad scale, not just for the, the top-funded hospitals that are out there? Yeah, that is the major limiter of the use of artificial intelligence nationally or globally is do we have healthcare provider networks that are actually technologically sophisticated enough to take advantage of artificial intelligence? And the short answer is no, we don't. And therefore, unfortunately, only a fragment of uh, U.S. population has an access to the best of what U.S. healthcare has to offer because the provider network is so fragmented. The largest healthcare networks, the most sophisticated ones, maybe have two or three percent of market share. The government looks at consolidation in, in the hospital business and says that that is the reason for why prices have gone up in some places. I've seen it but even in a Wall Street Journal article that yeah. just recently put this out. Is that the case from the hospital's perspective? I mean, not, not really. <laughs> not, not really. I mean, we're, we're, the, we're the largest industry in the United States, as, as mentioned, the you know, largest share of GDP. Yet the largest health care provider in the United States is 3.5% of the U.S. market. There is no other industry in the United States where leading providers have such a small market share. But what is even more important 
that fragmentation limits the availability of the best that U.S. healthcare has to offer to, to fellow Americans. So what is the cause for the increase in GDP? It's 17 percent and growing for health care. How do we get our arms around that and try and shrink the expansion, particularly when we're looking for better and better measures that are going to cost more and more money? Just like in any other industry, scaling makes sense. Scaling typically leads to lower cost, higher efficiency, and that is one part, one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that we actually have much more to offer to our patients over time. We're, we're, we're speaking about all these new modalities, both treatment modalities, diagnostic modalities. They're also very, very costly. So as we have more to offer, the price of healthcare continues to grow. But I do believe that a meaningful consolidation uh, would really allow us to, A, decrease the cost, also through the use of better use of technology, and B, and most importantly, offer the best of healthcare to more people in need. The other issue is cybersecurity, because these are such sensitive records that you all hold. I mean, the, the, the holy grail has always been having one electronic record that follows you everywhere, that all your doctors, all your hospitals have access to using and making sure that you understand it. We're not there yet, decades after talking about this. And we see these massive attacks, like the recent one that uh, United Health had to deal with. Yes. Um, uh, the vulnerabilities that are there also require a lot of money to be spent on this. The tremendous vulnerability. And uh, as providers struggle with a very low margin, or half of the hospitals in the United States are currently actually losing money, it is difficult, it is difficult to envision the large investments in cybersecurity. So only very few systems have a sophistication and an ability to protect their business and their patients from cybersecurity attacks, which I would believe is, I would say, is the greatest risk for our ability to continue to provide care to our patients is the cybersecurity. What would you do if uh, you could be czar for the day and, and try and figure out what needs to be done, uh, maybe top one or two items that you would fix when it comes to our health care system? I think that we have to start to look at the scale and the consolidation of the providers. That would be one. And the other one would be really look at the leveraging of our information and our sophistication in, in digital technology to really to lower the cost of care, improve the, improve the quality of care at scale.